Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 26th edition of Data Bytes, Getting Things Done with Data in Government, supported this month by Bearing Point. I'm Gavin Freegard, Associate at the Institute for Government, and it's wonderful to welcome you all this evening to the first Data Bytes of 2022. Let's start in the traditional Data Bytes way. Hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Welcome back. And hands up if this is your first Data Bytes. Welcome. Hands up if you've been to an alleged gathering on government property during COVID restrictions that's being investigated by the Metropolitan Police. Good. And hands up if you're waiting for the Metropolitan Police to tell you whether you've been to an alleged gathering on government property during COVID restrictions that's being investigated by the Metropolitan Police. Good evening, Prime Minister. But tonight, forget the alleged Downing Street ABBA party, because mamma mia, do I have a super trooper presenters that you will go head over heels for. It's true. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. I'll resist the temptation to go on and on and on with the ABBA joke so we can hasten the arrival of our four excellent speakers talking about their data projects. Because, of course, tonight, that's the name of the game. Let's start with the usual virtual housekeeping. Tonight's event is on the record and we are being live streamed, obviously. If you'd like to get involved on social media, it's hashtag IFG Data Bytes, and we're live tweeting from at IFG events. And remember, I'll be putting your questions to our speakers. You can submit those via the Slido page you're almost certainly watching this on. If you're not, go to bit.ly slash Slido DB26. Why does the Institute for Government host Data Bytes? Well, we want to bring together the various different data communities in and around government and the public sector. We want to show people who don't think of themselves as data people what better data means and what it can achieve. And we want to put interesting data projects on the record for us all to learn from. That's the why, now the how. You're going to be treated to four presentations about data this evening. Each of our speakers will have eight minutes to present. Yes, just eight minutes. It would have been longer, but the Metropolitan Police asked us not to. Not really, there are eight bits in a byte, hence eight minutes in a data byte. Each of our speakers will then take questions for eight minutes. Yes, just eight minutes. Then we move on to the next speaker. So four presentations of eight minutes, each followed by questions for eight minutes. As I said, tonight's event is our 26th. You can watch the previous 25, including our previous one in December on the IFG website. So what's happened in government and politics since we last met on the 1st of December? Well. We've had two parliamentary by-elections. Here are the swings for and against the government in by-elections since 1945. Last year's Hartlepool by-election was an outlier with one of the largest swings towards the government since the war. In December, Bexley and Old Sidcup was more like the norm, a seat the government held despite a swing against it, while North Shropshire was an outlier at the other end, the Lib Dems seizing it with a huge swing. It's now 91 days since controversial Commons vote let North Shropshire's former MP, Owen Patterson, off without punishment despite a standards report finding against him, arguably kicking off everything we've seen since. We've had two ministerial resignations. A week before Christmas, Lord Frost became the first of two Lords leaping out of government, quitting the Cabinet over its direction of travel. And just last week, Lord Agnew resigned at the dispatch box over the government's failure to tackle fraud. And we've had two Tory MPs change allegiance. Anne-Marie Morris had the whip withdrawn after voting in favour of cutting VAT on energy bills. And most dramatically, Christian Wakeford became the first MP to defect from the Conservatives to Labour since 2007. But of course, this week, everyone was on tenterhooks waiting for the blockbuster report and covering exactly what was going on in government during the pandemic. And on Monday, finally, the Institute for Government's ninth Whitehall Monitor report was published. If you weren't expecting that joke, you don't follow enough IFG staff on Twitter. Chock full of charts, the report found that major reform is necessary if government is to meet its policy goals while dealing with current crises. Major reform in areas including government accountability and transparency. Much more on the IFG website on that. Monday also saw the publication of that other blockbuster report and covering exactly what was going on in government during the pandemic, Sue Gray's investigation into alleged gatherings on government premises during COVID restrictions, colon, update. It was a lot shorter than we originally expected. This is our now familiar chart of the word count of various great works of literature and government publications. The Gray update came in at just 3,491 words. 
Nonetheless, it turned out to be quite meaningful, giving us some more details of the lockdown breaking parties under investigation. Of the 16 parties Sue Gray uncovered, four did not meet the threshold for police investigation. Twelve did. And of those, the Prime Minister is understood to have been at at least three of them. I mean, it was three when I first put these slides together. It may be more now. Even by the standards of data bytes in the last three years of British politics, I'm playing an almighty game of chart chicken with the news cycle tonight. And yes, I'm aware that Wordle is based on five letter words, but I can't imagine it's five letter words that are currently doing the rounds in Downing Street. At one of those parties, it's alleged that the Prime Minister was ambushed with a birthday cake. An image, not believed to be one of the 300 handed over to the police, has recently emerged showing one of the prime suspects. It seems David Cameron prefers caterpillar cakes to fruit cakes, since they're not accompanied by loonies and closet racists. Who knows what position the PM will be in by the time we meet next month? This chart shows the time in office of prime ministers since the Second World War. If Boris Johnson wants to overtake Gordon Brown, he'll need to make it to the 8th of June. Having been ambushed by cake, the PM is now hoping his MPs choose not to desert. Turning to tonight's speakers, we have a bit of a theme, how data systems can be built around people and particularly patients. Thank you to both the community of practice run by Future Care Capital and the Health Foundation, and to the Motives for Measurement Peer Learning Group at the Blavatnik School of Government for suggesting speakers. Our first speaker this evening is Hamish Tibley, director at tonight's sponsor, Bearing Point. He'll be talking about how humanising the use of NHS data can lead to performance improvement and better person outcomes. Then we'll hear from John Bryant, Head of Strategy and Development at Tor Bay Council on Greener Care Collaborative, releasing Time to Care. After that, we'll hear from Arnie King, Research and Policy Lead at Co-Produce Care CIC on social care voice data for those receiving worst outcomes. And our fourth and final speaker of the evening will be Juliana utez Velarde, Data Steward at the Government Outcomes Lab at the Blavatnik School of Government in Oxford on better data for social outcomes. Our next data bytes will be at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, the 2nd of March. Do join us then, and then on the first Wednesday of each month to July when we break for the summer. Believe me, we have some brilliant speakers lined up already. We're only able to continue data bytes thanks to the support of our partners, and we are very grateful to Bearing Point for supporting tonight's event. If you'd like your organisation to follow in Bearing Point's virtuous footsteps and support data bytes, please get in touch with my colleague Pratesh. And if you'd like to follow in the virtuous footsteps of our presenters this evening and speak at a future Data Bytes, please get in touch with me. If you would like to continue this work event by having some wine at your desk, you can of course join us for virtual drinks afterwards. We'll put these details up again at the end. The link is bit.ly slash DB26 drinks, password IFGDB26. But without any further ado, let's hear from our first speaker this evening. Hamish, over to you. Good evening. Um, thank you very much, Gavin. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, my name's Hamish Dibley. I've got eight minutes or just under to talk to you about humanising data in the NHS for performance improvement purposes. Before I do so, I want to start with a little quote from the late Sir John Templeton, um, because this will be a recurring theme, hopefully throughout the next eight minutes or so. I think what he said then is right and I think it applies ever so much now as well. If you want better performance, you've got to do things differently. In terms of where we are in the NHS and the challenges, I've interpreted this as a pandemic moving into potential paradigm shift. Uh, colleagues on this call will all be familiar that uh, at the moment, as a consequence of the last couple of years, we are facing unprecedented demand in all aspects of the healthcare system, from the emergency urgent care system right through to the backlogs in planned care, and of course, outside of the hospital in demand management issues facing primary care, community mental health, and adult social care. That means we've got to think differently about how we tackle our challenges. It also means we've got to challenge NHS analytical conventions, or what I call activity obsession disorder, which is where we place far too much emphasis on what I call activity analysis, which is a way in which we try to uh, manage and improve healthcare systems just by looking at the lens of activity and costs. There's a smarter, better way to tackle the challenges facing not only the NHS, but also the broader public services, and that is by humanising data. 
The logic in the approach is that if you want better services at less cost, you have to look at healthcare data differently, not from the lens of activity, but from the person or the patient centre and perspective. Definition of demand in healthcare is a person who comprises a number of interactions that he may or she may make on a service over an agreed period of time. And you're going to see some examples of that right now. We need to challenge the current convention. In the NHS, we have a tendency to convert patient needs and their demands into activities and attribute a price or a cost to every activity. We can do better than that. And the better way looks like this. This is a case study of a, a real hospital serving a constituency population of 650,000 people. And at this point, it's important to differentiate between healthcare populations and patient demand. This is the means to intelligent population health management. Over time series data, which is more than one, one year's worth, this goes back multiple years, I can only put two years on a slide, you see what you see in front of you, which is the perception is rising demand, but actually demand in patient terms is far more stable. It's 227,000 people, less than 1% increase. Expressed in relative terms, that's a steady state of a third every year needing to use the acute hospital in one shape or form. Representing demand is running at 56%. Representing demand means that if we see you in year one, what's the probability we'll see you in successive years? That's extraordinarily high. And having done this over several areas now, it's a consistent theme that it's stable, it's predictable, but the representation of seeing the same patients every year is, is, is very, very telling. So we know 227,000 people come into this hospital system and that's consistent across the NHS and where I've done this work elsewhere. The next question is to ask, how many people do we see in the urgent care system and the planned care system? Because what is really revealing is the fact that in healthcare, you're dealing with different customer bases. The people you see in the urgent and planned care system are generally separate. Where they collide and where they come across, and here you see 9.5%, are what I call the vital few. The vital few you find through segmentation analysis to create a typology of demand based on their consumption. In this hospital, remember it sees 227,000 people, it's actually 12,935 unique people that are behind a 20% of all the activity and 30% of the costs. So if we're serious at making indentations into demand pressures in urgent and planned care, we have to focus on these patients first. These are some proto charts looking just at A&E data. I want to focus on the first one for the brevity of time. It applies here too. The problem at the front door and in this hospital that saw 90,000 people is actually less than 4,000 people behind 20% of the work and over a fifth of all the A&E four hour breaches. Extended into the beds, again, we see the same phenomena. The problem isn't rising demand, it's the vital few. 2,000 patients behind 45% of the non-elective bed capacity. And this is a reoccurring problem year on year. Move that over to outpatients and in planned care. You see the same phenomena. It's a different sector, same problem. Top 5% of outpatient demand this time is on 6,544 people responsible for approaching 20% of all the work, or as it says there, 31,000 separate work activities that is extortionately high. A little bit about the vital few, it challenges common perceptions this work. Half of them are under 65, they're not for our elderly. And tellingly, when you look at their use of condition profiles, you discover that 22% of the time that they come in, it is absolutely nothing to do with their chronic condition profile. So when we're thinking about healthcare populations, we need to have that in mind that yes, every uh, every time they come in, we need to be conscious of understanding why they're coming in and relative to who they are as an individual, not just their conditions. And to conclude, by looking at the costs, the costs are a lagging indicator. The vital few here are estimated to cost this hospital in excess now of a, nearly approaching £130 million. Pounds. The financial opportunities not only extend to improving performance against the targets, but also looking at the savings you can make and the reoccurring savings from a conservative base, as it's indicated there, 6 million, 13 million, 19 million pounds. It makes sense to focus on the vital few to see performance improvement. By way of conclusion and opportunities, 
Unlike patient activity levels, patient demand is far more stable and predictable, but as I've articulated tonight, it is grossly uneven and therefore needs to be understood. All healthcare systems suffer from high levels of what's referred to as representing or amplification of demand amongst relatively small numbers of their local populations, the vital few. These people are geographically concentrated as well, and that's important to note. Moreover, when you extend the research and the data analytics out into the other fields beyond the hospital, you see that there is a strong association with these vital few patients consuming disproportionately high hospital care, not only in the acute sector, but also extending into the community mental health, adult social care and primary care and ambulances too. So humanising the data as part of humanising healthcare is the means to intelligently and successfully tackling those principal performance challenges that every local healthcare system faces. That's the means to achieving the healthcare holy grail. I'm going to conclude with a quote. It's important to note that all the problems that we face in our systems, the solutions to them are also in the system. We just have to have the right mindset and use the right methods. If I've made you curious tonight, here's some further information that I hope you'll take with you. Thank you very much for your time. I think I finished just on time, Gavin. I think you did indeed. Thank you very much, Hamish. Um, just a reminder to everybody watching, uh, if you would like to put your questions or, well, put your questions to me for me to put them to Hamish, please do use our Slido. Those of you using the Slido to make further ABBA puns, I can see you. Um, but do tell us who you are uh, and where you're from uh, as well. Um, I think you may need to turn your camera on, Hamish, and then hopefully we'll be able to see you. Excellent. So um, we've got a question from Sam Smith from Med Confidential. Good evening and Happy New Year to you, Sam. Um, he says this matches other similar analyses, suggesting the problem isn't lack of data sharing or patients having too many rights about data, but more that no one is doing anything with the analysis on the data that already exists. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I would agree entirely. Um, so part of this work is not only looking at what the problem is, you've just heard me talk for eight minutes about that. So quantitative analysis can only ever tell you what the problem is. It can never tell you why, which is if I get invited, I'm fortunate enough to be invited back for another eight minutes, I'll tell you the other part of the equation, which is some of the other techniques you use to deploy to understand how you actually then think about designing services that work effectively for these patients. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I, I won't ask you to do another full eight minutes, but I might ask a question which gets a little bit of that, which is if you're a patient or a practitioner, what would a, a sort of humanising healthcare data revolution look like? How would it feel? What would it sort of look like on, on the ground, as it were? Uh, well, it depends who you're asking. So if it's a healthcare professional, we'll start with that. It's about actually giving you the helicopter view first and foremost to actually understand the patients who are causing the pressure points in the various parts of the system. And that is as equally as important for a clinician as it is for an allied healthcare, healthcare professional as it is for a senior executive. At the moment, I think it was Stephen Dole some years ago when he was chairman of the Health Select Committee, he wrote a report talking about the system flying blind in the absence of intelligent information about demand. I would agree with him. But demand for me is person shaped. So it's about understanding who our customer bases are, who our people are, who our patients are, and then how appropriate it is that we're doing the nature of the activity when we're doing it and where we're doing it. From the patient perspective, um, you will see a radical transformation in the way that we conceive and deliver of care. Too many times we, we, we face, and I've had personal experience of this only very recently, of failings in predictable planned care, for example, uh, that shouldn't ever happen. So outpatient appointments that should be made that aren't made, cancellations of procedures at the last moment that shouldn't take place. Part of the reason why that happens is because hopefully I've articulated that in the presentation this evening. We're trying to chase our tail by looking through the rear view mirror, by focusing on activity in the absence of understanding patients. Thank you. Um, We've got another question from Anonymous. Good evening and Happy New Year to you, Anonymous. Uh, is this cohort disproportionately sicker or with complex medical needs or simply using the system more? And or is there a way in which these individuals could be treated in a way which helps them better and at lower cost to the NHS? 
the good news is the answer is yes, and it's been done several times. What we need to do is scale and sustain it and mainstream these approaches. So uh, as I said in the call, uh, the presentation earlier, um, yes, they have more consumption than the average person consuming the hospital, but it isn't necessarily related to A, their age, because typically when you do this, you find that two thirds to 50 percent, as in the case of this particular hospital, are under the age of 65. So they may be frail, but they're certainly not frail elderly. Where you have the frail elderly problem is in the back door, the inability to discharge but even then, it's on really, really small numbers of the same people that keep pinballing around the system. The other point, which I think the uh, the viewer made reference to, is their condition profile. And this is where this work departs with typical classic conventional population health management approaches, is that we need to conceive and understand that these patients, when they're coming in, particularly in the emergency urgent care system, it's very little related to their condition profile. In the case of that case study in the hospital, uh, only 22% of the time that they were coming through the emergency care system did it have any reference to their condition profile. What it had reference to was the fact that they weren't coping. They had social, emotional, psychological and environmental problems that a medical transactional system can not deal with. So if we know we've got a lot of these patients, then that's a sign that we need to design services around their needs, not around our needs. Thanks. We've got about three and a half minutes left. If you've got any more questions that you want to put to Hamish, we've got one from Jonathan Flowers. Evening to you. Um, he says, I seem to recall that the work on total place a decade or so ago identified that the most vulnerable cohort with high demand for health were also demanding of other public services too. Any evidence for that from this analysis? And do you have any other data sets to correlate? Uh, I have the data sets where I've done the data work uh, and what Jonathan says is very true. I mean, it not only predates total place, but I also tend to remember under the Cameron years, the troubled families agenda. Uh, the problem with both of those initiatives, and I was at the time working in local government, was it was a problem of method. Uh, the way we sought to actually understand and then improve the from the findings we gleaned was actually the problem. We incentivised the wrong behaviours. Um, where I've done this work in adult social care, the readover is very, very high and we have the same problem there. I've also done this and extended this work out to beyond the hospital. So typically and classically in community mental health, you'll see uh, a 75 to 85 percent readover in terms of the ratio between the vital few in the acute and the vital few in the community primary. Same with um, uh, community mental health, same in primary care as well. It's common that five or six percent of the highest consumers in primary care will be behind 30 to 40 percent of the cost in the acute. Uh, and very interesting, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to work in policing with the Met Police. Uh, that was revealing because, again, these were often the same people, not exclusively, but often they were. Uh, and what we found with the Met Police was that caller demand was actually going down, uh, but it was congregating on stupidly small numbers of people. I tend to remember a figure of 679 unique people in the city of London, for example, who were behind 6% of the caller demand and 4% of the police responses. Um, I think we can do better. Thank you. That flows really nicely um, into the next question, actually, which is also from Anonymous. I don't know if it's the same Anonymous or a different one, but good evening anyway. Um, do you think that there would be a benefit in taking an even wider approach, not just health, as there seems to be quite a lot of data that suggests the demand for health is a symptom of other things? Uh, yes and no. So um, as my presentation hopefully alluded to, um, recognising it was only a snapshot, um, in the urgent and emergency care system, what you'll find is acute hospitals are dealing with the system failures and trying to mop up reactively the system failures of other parts of the public service and sometimes other parts of the healthcare system. So I refer to kind of archetypal patients. One of them, one suite of them are called pinball patients. And these are the patients who have non-medical problems, which obviously then cause them to need to go into the only part of the system that actually can't turn them the way through rationing devices or eligibility criteria. In planned care, it's different because you're dealing with a completely different customer base where you see the phenomena of what I call plan care tipping, which is in healthcare, what we do is we make people wait longer and longer for their procedures and for, for their appointments, never more so than the last two years as a consequence of the special cause variation caused by the pandemic, which means that disproportionate numbers of those patients will tip into an emergency situation and they should never do that. 
Thanks. And I'm going to ask you to answer this final question in about 10 seconds. Um, you've mentioned age. To what level have other demographics of people been analysed? Are there any surprising findings, especially around intersectional characteristics people might have? Um, I can't do that justice in 10 seconds, but there's a whole wealth of information I'm happily able to share if I'm kindly invited back for a, a second round. Excellent. Well, Hamish, thank you very much indeed for getting Databytes in 2022 off to such a great start. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, and we now go to our second uh, speaker this evening, and that's John. Over to you, John. Good evening, Gary. Good evening, everybody. My name is John Bryant. I'm head of strategy and development down in Torbay. And I'd like to share with you some of the findings that we had working with our domiciliary care providers and with the intention of releasing time to care and time to be more caring. And that was our starting point. And the title of the Greener Care Collaborative came out of the learning that we did in working with them. And we'll touch on some of the motivations behind that during the presentation. Many of you will be aware of the national challenge that we have in respect of social care and finding enough staff it mirrors what's going on in the NHS and many other parts of the economy, of course. But it's been very prevalent uh, in terms of the news around discharges, etc. And but often there may well be a perception that uh, the trouble is domiciliary care providers are not very good at recruiting. And if we're not careful, one can, with good heart and good intent, start to step into that space of, well, we best give them a hand with the recruiting. We might even do it for them. We'll find a way that we can support them in that way, and perhaps with NHS intervention. So the trouble is that domiciliary care, are not very, domiciliary care providers aren't very good at recruiting. And what we then learn, if we look into the numbers, is that, in fact, over a period between November 19 and October 21, they actually recruited an additional 39% capacity in Torbay. So that's 16, one six providers managed to produce a further 39% capacity in caring through a COVID period. In fact, they peaked at 48.5%. The challenge was that the demand for services grew by 47%. And so when we start to look at what's going on in there, it's not that they're not good at recruiting. I would happily celebrate with anybody else in our systems that would be able to record a 39% capacity increase uh, and, and stand on the top step with them uh, in that regard. Uh, it's the fact that we still don't have sufficient demand uh, supply. And behind that, it then behoves us to start looking at what we might do with the capacity it's there. So what we looked at and what you can see here is a little outline of Torbay, which is a, an area, three towns, Brixham, Paynton and Torquay that's down on the southwest coast in Devon. And it's got a perimeter of 75 miles, 75 miles all the way around. That's pertinent in as much as when we start to look at those smaller areas within that space, in the darker brown areas, you'll see that there are 11 providers servicing one small area. In the lighter brown ones, there's in fact 10 providers. So what we find is that we've got a whole host of people servicing the same area. In the end part of that slide, there's some segmentation. And what that segmentation aims to display is that in particular areas, we have one or two significant providers. There's an efficiency by having them there. But over a period of time, we've topped that up with a multiplicity of other providers to go in and support them with that care. And you may say, well, how does that come about, John? The fact of the matter is the way that care is traditionally allocated is that with a suite of providers available to uh, to the area, a requirement for a care package and a time slot will be put out to the market. And the market will say, well, actually, I have that skill set. I have the staff available and I can map, meet that time at half past eight in the morning for that particular uh, item. That may be true on the Tuesday or the Wednesday. A week later, a similar time slot, maybe 45 minutes later, comes up, but that provider does not have either the skill set or the capacity. So it goes out to the market and somebody says, well, I can do that for you, John. And they take that. But what we've got over a period is this organic growth in uh, a dysfunctional complexity, if you will. So what might it look like if we started to get a bit smarter in helping people to manage their efficiencies? 
Well, what we looked at was initially over a 10 month period and with the support of our providers, we've extended that to 20 months. What we've identified is that in a 75 mile perimeter radius, which I said was going to be important, they travel over 832,000 miles a year to deliver the care. That's one six, 16 providers. It's costing the system quarter of a million pounds in travel, uh, which could be better deployed in training, well-being, and more face-to-face -face care. But even more importantly, we're losing 41,000 hours of face-to-face -face care time. And these people didn't sign up to be multi-drop delivery drivers. They signed up to be care providers. So they're really keen to do that. So what might it look like if we start to get a little bit sharper in terms of how we can organise that for them? And we set ourselves the target of 12% saving on travel. And what we recognised was at the moment, they're travelling almost twice to the moon and back every year, which is just outrageous. With a 12% reduction in travel, we would be able to achieve something that would be the equivalent of four times the circumference of the Earth. And we wanted to use this data in a way because this speaks to hearts and minds. And for many of you, you'll be very familiar with the numbers and would very happily take them in the table as we start to reach out to a broader stake of stakeholders and we have to move some things around and there is a change curve that's associated with this. We wanted to make it. Interpretable. Impactful for them. But the key behind it all is we could release nearly 5000 hours worth of care by a 12 percent saving in travel. In fact, the numbers that we're coming up with at the moment would indicate that we are looking at potential savings in excess of 20 percent. And with that saving, we're then in a far better place to start to deliver on the five aims of population health management and picking up on some of Hamish's information and his sharing earlier. Um, the ability for us to begin to support people with those additional elements, challenges, social, um, social connections that they need to enable them to have well-being is increasing if we do this work and then we can take pressure off other parts of the system. Most importantly, uh, alongside this, we start to look at the well-being and engagement of the workforce to the extent that their capacity continues to build because we've given them more time to do what it is that they signed up to do. And just to leave you with some reflection points, uh, we'd say uh, ask the unasked question. And then listen deeply. One of the things that came back for us was we deal with very vulnerable people, um, so evidently that's where the focus is going to be. But what came out for us is you can never underestimate people's motivations and desires. And the Greener Care Collaborative was born out of a real commitment to make life better, not only for those that we serve, but for those of the next generation as well, and who in, the, in their own right would be serving that population. That's it for me, Gavin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, for those of you who would like to, remember you can use Slido to put your questions to John. If you're not already watching on Slido, then go to bit.ly slash Slido DB26 capital S capital DB. And I think if you stop sharing your slides, John, we'll be able to see you uh, perfectly. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got questions coming in already, so let's start with one from Jonathan. Um, he asks, how do we improve the culture of data use in and around social care so that this sort of analysis, which to, for instance, operational research types might seem quote unquote obvious, becomes a commonplace? And he says that is not in any way to take away from the pioneering work that you and Torbay are doing. Uh, for me, it's about trust. So one of our reflection pieces at the end was about trust. And candidly, Jonathan, um, it's about, John, do I trust you to do something useful with this? Sh you know, in, in the old Jerry Maguire phrase, it would be show me the money. Uh, and that's not about the providers. In this case, it's show me the activity. What is the decision that you have made or that you have facilitated and the change that you have brought about that recognises that there is potential in here and that you have facilitated collaboration, coordination? It's not for you to deliver but it's for you, John, to bring that about. And I think where we are able to engage with a wide range of stakeholders to show how we can use data to better support better outcomes 
then we start to get people to say, well, I can now understand why it's important for me to input it. So one of the things that we talk about is volume and quality. Uh, you can increase the volume, doesn't necessarily mean you get any better quality. Well, you may get really good quality, but you just can't get sufficient numbers to put that in. And so when we started off on this uh, journey 20 months ago, it was building on a platform of collaboration that we built up over the last three years with some pretty dedicated work on demonstrating that as a combined collaborative, that we were a totality in terms of providers looking after their staff, commissioners looking after the providers, that we felt we could do something about this and that this was worth the endeavour. What we're now looking at with this data, and it speaks to the little moon and the, the world and all the rest, is how we start to now communicate that to a broader audience so that they can come on the journey. And one of the things that we did with the Health Foundation was the commitment to hearts and minds. So it's not just about the numbers, John. It's not just about your measurements or metrics. It's not just about your finances. It's what it means to me. And I have a responsibility in the system as a patient and a client, John. Yes, I'm getting my care, but actually now what I understand is that there's a lot of people that are not getting care and require it. And that whilst it may be a little disruptive for me in the short term, I can now see how important it is for me to go on that journey with you. And yes, I'm looking forward to meeting my new team. So it's that trust building, give them the explanation, provide the vision, support them, shallow the change curve uh, and do it and make sure we communicate in ways that are both timely and and. Uh, understandable by those that are receiving it. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Um, we've got a question from Anonymous. Um, do you join up your buying with neighbouring authorities so you aren't paying two different agencies to travel to clients who are neighbours that have a council border down the middle of their street? Uh, that's a great question because uh, we do have uh, a lot of border in common uh, with that. Uh, we have close working relationships. We have a contract that, in fact, has title in common, but we don't join up in that way. Under the new uh, integrated care system, we have four local care partnerships, and our local care partnership for Torbay also spans into Devon. Less about the buying than it is about the rotaring. What's really interesting in this space is that the Greener Care Collaborative is provider driven. We've encouraged them to have ownership of this. And to that end, they're the ones that are moving their own packages and looking to talk to one another to make this happen. The same would happen across borders. So absolutely uh, vital to make that happen. We'd encourage it to be provider led rather and supported by commissioners rather than commissioner led. Because we think that's where the ownership and one of the big challenges behind this um, in the domiciliary care space, for those that are possibly a little less familiar with social care, is that there is a suite of clients that are social care contracted by the public sector, and there is a suite of clients and a cohort of clients that are private. There's always been an anxiety about the data surfacing where social care commissioners can see the private client base and start to make, make views or have perspectives on that. Doing it in this way, and where there is trust in place between the providers, they're able to use that, put it all in, and then they have really uh, very relevant, if I put it that way, very relevant conversations about how they can move the packages around. The one thing that we would recognise in that space is, and this came again from providers a couple of years back, uh, when they said, this is a non-competitive market. That was a real, that was a, a nugget, that was a turning point for everybody. The competition is not for business. There's more business than you can possibly imagine. The competition is for being in the right place at the right time and having the right staff with the right skills. And that, that was then a collaborative effort. Great, thank you. We've got about two and a half minutes left, so some time still to get your questions in. We've got another question from Viara Apostolova. Good evening to you. Um, they ask, do you have plans for undertaking similar analysis for other providers of public services across the council? Really great question. So, and again, uh, it sort of builds on what Hamish, some of what Hamish was saying. We feel that there is a massively untapped opportunity in the uh, social care and primary care interface and the community services interface. One of the bits of analysis that we did demonstrated that of the community nursing 
patients, there was a 20% overlap in the community nursing round to the domiciliary care clients. So in other words, we had community nurses visiting the same people that were patients of theirs, clients of domiciliary care. The question arises, are there activities that with suitable training, oversight and work could be undertaken by one or the other party? How do we support our community nursing staff to work to the top of their license? And at the same time, we're having a really interesting set of conversations with pharmacy. Who would know that pharmacy had a community presence in terms of a door to door service? So what does it start to look like in terms of looking at how the movement of a whole host of um, health and care system colleagues are moving around? Uh, if we can start to drill down on who is doing what and where and when, we can start to join things up. So it's a great question. Yes, it expands beyond domiciliary care. Thanks. And with our final 50 seconds or so, um, we often find there are some you know, really great initiatives like this going on um, in pockets across the country. How do you share that knowledge? How do you help other people to sort of pick up what you're doing? I, I think with the invitation and the support of yourselves, Gavin, to present this, to write it up, we've blogged about it and continue to do so. Uh, we're ever so grateful to the Health Foundation for providing us with the uh, the headroom and the impetus to enable us to undertake this uh, and do it. Um, and one of our commitments is to make sure that that sharing takes place through publication, through the materials, through the types of approach that we've taken. Um, and then, to, as always, we're here. We believe very much in sharing. Uh, and if people were to ask the question, we're very happy to uh, to give them. It's a public pound, as we always say. And to that end, let's make it go as far as it possibly can. Brilliant. Well, John, um, thank you very much indeed. It's been uh, great to learn more about what you're doing in down, down in Till Bay. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I should also say there's a fantastic question from Anonymous, which is, are you in daylight or is that just a very good lamp? Which I have to say I was wondering myself. Um, we now go to our third speaker of this evening. Over to Arnie. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for uh, organising, inviting me. It's been really great to even listen to the contributions so far, and hopefully I'll add. I am uh, on theme, as though it was planned, but um, I will also hopefully go into quite a bit of detail in answer to the first question in uh, John's um, presentation there. Um, but my name's Arnie. I head research over at Manor Community and co-produce care. Manor Community is a fairly conventional care provider based in Bristol. One thing to note though is primarily provide uh, focuses care and support for people of working age so that circumstances around learning disabilities, autism and mental health, as opposed to older people, which um, both in commissioning and in the general public's understanding and perception of care maybe gets a bit more of a focus. Um, but it's really, really important to understand that we already know about a third of people accessing care are working age and it's related to intellectual disability. Um, and that's with uh, the big inspectors like CQC releasing regular sort of policy and reviews that show that the care and the reach, um, the quality and the reach of services um, is stopping people accessing good quality care from that group. Um, we're also facing a crisis in social care, both for workforce, which I'm glad John um, really tackled that uh, um, conception, but it's the provider's issue to try and promote, uh, recruit more people um, when actually they're doing everything they can and doing very, very well. Uh, but it's uh, what are you recruiting people into is the answer. Uh, we've started co-produce care in the last few years as I've worked at Manor Community to be a democratic network for care at every level. Um, so we've been running um, sort of policy work or media and forum kind of activities um, and it's all been sort of supported by uh, projects I've led on improving tech in social care. That's been everything from paperless systems up to sort of um, Microsoft Teams for work communications and things like that. Um, the big things to know uh, from, from that experience though is both the opportunity that exists to improve public understanding and sort of policy understanding about that need, that need to re recognise and reward care and care work as being an advocacy service for people of working age who are who have faced barriers to independent, confident life. So that's not sort of um, 
standardized repeated issues that could be obviously very very complex related to palliative and end of life care but the thing that each person's life has to be walked through with care and it's currently not structured to be recognized and wanted to do that um, so i'm going to talk about a project we've been coming to the end of now which is to test whether machine learning can be used accurately uh, and effectively to understand uh, the feedback data based on text from people who have learning disabilities, autism and mental health. That's to achieve a few things, but I'll talk about that as we move through the uh, presentation. Hopefully that's moving along. Oh, yeah, just took a second. Great. So um, a big thing is worst outcomes. That was the Health Foundation's um, remit, but with conversations with multiple local authorities, we obviously agreed that it's the group that I've given the reasons for there. And then we're seeing one, do the tools physically understand that group? If you start using automated analytics to understand the voice of that group, does it work on one level? We're also putting in demographic sort of factors so we can compare age, gender, ethnicity, location, type of service, type of setting, all of that to do a couple things. One, see what those groups say if that differs that's an important uh, note could we understand that group more we understand how we can improve care services so that it reaches and follows that group throughout their life but two we also know if we can also start to see if those um sort of more um issues around inherent bias that might exist on top level algorithmic analytics, um, whether that will affect the use of this uh, tool in care. But that third point is why we've got in involved and that's been the lead of what I've been doing for the project throughout. And that is how do we actually implement these changes, implement these tools, implement these innovations. So exactly as John was saying there, it's not a top down change that comes from people who know all about these tools and are saying, yes, that's great, get, get them in, do it. That's obviously the future. How do we, even for people on the ground who would agree that that's, that's the case, but just don't trust that that big change is worthwhile or worth learning all the new skills, as we said, especially at a time when the workforce faces so much strain. It's interesting to note that we've had at every level of engagement and co-production from people accessing care, frontline care workers, all the way up to commissioners and local authority representatives, both ends of that spectrum, both the sort of um, worry that a big change like this isn't the right thing to just bring down the line and be a bit of sort of intimidated by the tech all the way to the other side which is a very sort of dazzled oh the computer will do my job for me i'll press enter and i'll get all the answers once a year and that's all done for me so we're tackling that um by what i'll talk towards the end as a blueprint of how to implement this on a regional level that will empower social care and the people who access it just a quick note on uh, who else has been involved. So obviously multiple local authorities. I've just put in Bristol there as a sort of representation. We've also had an expert data analytics team whose history is to work for uh, councils and governments and be that sort of third party analytics uh, expert. But also, we've brought in key st stakeholder partners. So these are providers like us at Manor Community who have that reach to the ground, but can also target certain demographics in the in the stakeholder wider stakeholder group so that we can put in those comparisons about what they say and whether uh, the tools work particularly better or worse for that group. And if that's a note, right. So I put what will success look like because we don't actually finish for another few weeks and hand everything in. We've had an initial tests and things like that to talk to now. But what the uh, top line is that the tools themselves are very um, accurate in interpreting and uh, representing uh, recommendations for change based on basic feedback data with people with learning disabilities, autism, mental health, saying what's good and bad about care in their lives. These tools do the job. We know that because local authorities have released their conventional, official, full scale sort of quality assurance results during that time and our results are you know tentatively until we hand in of course draft version um are um rep reflecting that mirroring exactly the kind of things those people are saying but what we are now completely filling out is the representation of the co-production we've based all the way through and that is covered here so research report will talk to the technical level the data set will be available for others to look at look at that um information and maybe put their own analysis in but we are now blueprinting a regional system led by the local authority to 
integrate care across a region where care workers and the people in communities both identify an issue, help word questioning so that uh, the right information is gathered. And then once the council has interpreted it, this granular level of breakdown that the uh, tools allow care workers and providers are then funded, being the main one, but also recognised and rewarded for acting on that advocacy, going into a community and making the whatever it is from buses, parks to social clubs, anything um, more accessible to every group that requires support um, so that it both improves care quality for that cohort and it makes care work a more rewarding job uh, and a more efficient, eff efficient job that you see the impact there. These tools that builds the trust, it shows people why these changes are coming down and it improves care from the ground up using it. Uh, I think that's my time, so I'll stop sharing there. That was, um, yeah, hopefully got through most of it. I think there's a few points I missed there, but um, look forward to hearing some questions now. Thanks very much, Arnie. It does go very quickly, doesn't it? Um, just a reminder to everybody, you can submit your questions to Arnie via me, uh, via Slido. And if you're not already on the page, go to bit.ly slash Slido DB26. Uh, we've already got some questions coming in. Um, again, from Jonathan Flowers, who asks, is there a risk of creating a feedback between machine and human learning whereby service users, carers, grapevine, get to find out key phrases to use in feedback and reports in order to secure desirable or avoid undesirable outcomes? Fantastic, incredible question. One of the um, bits of uh, research that exists already is that exact trend. People, especially with learning disabilities and autism, tend to say what they think they have to say in these scenarios so that the process goes away and nothing changes. What we're doing is tackling that. So if we're putting uh, these tools into social care, rather than it be something behind the curtain that affects monitoring overall, which to be fair is already happening and is already implemented in a lot of places, how do we now roll that down to a front line so that it affects people? Really interesting uh, anecdote from a project is that from a council that uh, of multiple councils we spoke to to define that group and say what's the information we need to gather to be able to test whether these tools do that job we had a set of questions that reflected an inspection that the CQC would run on an individual provider through registered managers on uh, in community providers that backed that up and filled it out we then had almost a dozen questions I and mean, it still reflected those principles it still attacked the stuff but um, you know, a bit codified and a bit sort of um complex and you know could almost trigger that kind of um response as well as being a bit more uh tricky to answer the data team who had no experience in social care at all um actually said can we just bring this down to five super open questions where it doesn't prompt it doesn't lead it doesn't do anything we just get as much data of people talking from that group as possible so we can run it through uh, the tools and see how well it's interpreted it so already we sort of were shown by the tools that it's much better to leave it as open as possible so you're not actually asking a question you are just giving opportunity for that person to talk about what's good and bad about their care also on the structuring the sort of regional level where care workers are involved in this and recognized for and rewarded for that that both means that the questioning becomes more organic and also the um setting in which that, that data is gathered isn't sit down it's your monthly quality assurance if you say anything bad then probably someone from the council might have something to say with it it's naturalizing as part of care a big conversation that empowers the voice of that person so as they talk throughout receiving care that is captured and it's captured very openly and it's a very flexible way to capture that data and it benefits both sides excellent thank you um i mean when it comes to working with with uh, sort of very vulnerable um cohorts and you know, i've seen various debates about sort of social care data um, around these sorts of issues have there been any other ethical concerns that you've had to consider when you've been working on this project absolutely covering this uh, sort of privacy of someone's information starting to talk about the sensitive issues that would come up about that and especially then who is looking at data and who can use it is going to be a huge part of how we roll this out on the front line so he said we were hopefully going to work more with the council data sets and look at what exists on that monitoring level on that where do you ping through different services and what do we already know about that and how do we track that 
Um, one of the first bits of learning was that on a, a very small pilot like this, where we are testing out a lot of other stuff, um, we had no chance of getting in there. So we needed a whole team in itself doing a whole project with lots of ethical work to even get close to that. So we've kept it very, very separate and we're doing our own sort of pilot thing that can the learning can then um, sort of contribute to that blueprint. What I would say on it is that the council already collect that data. The council already have the system set up for um, sensitive private data being held, collected and following someone throughout their life. Bearing in mind on these, on the way we're blueprinting, talking about it, we're not saying that everything that person says has to be recorded throughout their life. These are snapshot uh, feedback sort of gathering activities that give you regular granular sort of um, snapshots of what's going on in the region so that you can start to break down, oh, it's this issue over here, it's this issue over there. But if the council is where the sort of all the data is going to, it then makes it a significant regional a snapshot rather than just a provider to provider, sort of speaking to the people you know anyway. Um, and also it gives it that, um, you know, strengthening social care from a ground up aspect so especially as i said if it's funded <laughs> and recognized and rewarded properly that the providers are going to do that and it is in highlighting the group that needs listening to being a part of how to design the data collection so that it's as organic and uh, accurate and fair for the person as possible but then once it goes off to the council from everybody in a big confident, clear insight about what the issues are in that area are made, then the care providers can uh, just act on those insights. They'll know what, if bus, if buses is the top issue that comes up every time, they'll know much more than, uh, hey, our research has told us that buses need to be more accessible, so we put a big sign up in buses and we've done this and that. The people who advocate and support those people day to day will then be a part of making that change. So. Um, Leave it all up to council, I think, is the answer. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, we've got just over two minutes left. There is still time for your questions to come in. We've got one from Sam from Med Confidential. Um, he says the Department of Health and NHSX often look to spend millions on a shiny Google AI rather than supporting care providers. What's the one thing you would most want the expensive tech consultants in Whitehall to know about what you've learned from the frontline interaction in your work? But the tools work exactly how you think they will. Like there's, but they're not going to find something completely new and bespoke that completely solves care. Because if you ask this question and interpret it this way, then suddenly all the issues of people's health across communities is what we're talking about. As I keep saying, it's working age, intellectual disability. These are people who need support throughout their lives to make communities more accessible, to make their life more sort of confident and independent. We know that the answer is structural. So it's not about how the tools work. I can tell you now that there's an ontology that you can build that's very basic. That's the sort of roof, the rough grouping of terms that you would help the machine learning with so it can interpret the data more efficiently. That could be made very quickly and that would be very open, transparent and replicable and adaptable and everything like that. And then the wrangling process, which is basically how you get it from a care worker asking someone in a care home, in their home, wherever it is. How are you? <laughs> Would anything help you sort of live a happy, healthy life down to analytics in the council, which is both, yeah, how you collect that, physically record it, handle it and move it along, um, sort of database it and move it along. Um, those are very simple processes. It's keeping that transparent and it's empowering care from the ground up to, to be a part of it rather than save as a fancy tool that everyone up there now uses so if you don't do it your job differently then you won't get commissioned next time which won't help anyone excellent thanks arnie and i think with about 10 seconds left that's probably the perfect place uh, to leave it thank you very much indeed and we now go to our final speaker thank you thanks a lot our pleasure and we now go to our final speaker um of our first event of the year and that's juliana over to you Yes, so let me go into presentation mode. Great, so hi everybody. My name is Juliana and I work as a data steward for the Government Outcomes Lab. And I will be speaking about better data for better social outcomes for eight minutes. 
I will try to address three topics during my presentation. First of all, I'd like to explain how we work with government and why we think that it is important to work with civil servants and policymakers. I will then move on to explain how we built our impact on data set and how we started collecting data about outcome-based projects. And finally, I will highlight some useful points about the challenges and opportunities of working as a data collaborative. And after that, I will be happy to answer more questions. So first of all, I'd like to highlight that the GoLab has always worked very closely with the UK government. Since the very beginning, the GoLab has been a partnership between the Vlavatnik School of Government and the UK government's Directorate for Civil Society, which was formerly called the Office for Civil Society and is now called the Civil Society and Youth Directorate, located in the DCMS. These type of partnerships are incredibly unusual and what is really exciting about this one is that DCMS and the GoLab develop a joint learning agenda and a joint research agenda. So this agenda has two very important dimensions. On one side, the agenda is very connected to real policy challenges, but at the same time is rooted in rigorous research. And this is why getting data about these projects and these new approaches to public services is key for us. I will not go over all our research questions and learning interests because there is no, not enough time, but I will summarize them saying that we are interested in understanding how different sectors can work together to generate better services, better social programs or better social outcomes. The Go Lab tends to refer to this partnership as cross-sector partnerships, but this is just a fancy word to say that we want to understand how the public sector, the private sector and the third sector can work together. And this question became very relevant in the last years because there was a shift, a very important shift in the way that some authorities were commissioning services. What you see in this slide is a, a theory of change that I'm going to use to explain this shift. So the usual way of commissioning a public service involved a service provider that was very focused on the input part. So you would hire or contract a service provider and the service provider is contracted to develop an activity. After this activity, the service provider would receive a payment for the services. And then you would expect that those activities would generate some kind of outcome or some kind of change in people's life. But outcome-based commissioning is different. If you are doing outcome-based commissioning, it means that you are very interested in the outcome, not so much in the input, not so much in the activity, but you are really focusing on the outcome. And you really want to make sure that your project has a positive outcome in people's life. So then you are contracting for the outcome and you are not contracting for the activity. And this means that your contract with the service provider, maybe it doesn't have a specificities about the activity. It doesn't say anything about the service that the provider needs to deliver, but it does say very clearly what are the outcomes and the objectives that you need the service provider to achieve and how much you're going to pay for those outcomes, not for those inputs. As you may think, this sounds very good in theory, but in reality or in practice is very difficult to implement. It's really hard to start working on a social program if you don't have upfront capital, especially thinking that you're going, you are only going to get some money after you prove that you generated a positive social, social outcome. And this is why the idea of social impact bonds became so popular in the UK in the last years. Social impact bonds are a special type of outcome-based project where there are three key actors. So we have beneficiaries in the middle of this triangle who have complex, complex needs and need to be and those needs need to be addressed. We have a service provider that is going to deliver a service. We have an outcome payer or an outcome funder who's going to pay for those social outcomes. But now we have an investor. The role of the investor is to provide ad from capital to this service provider, so this provider can start working on the social program. When the provider finishes the activity and can prove to the outcome payer that they achieve positive social outcomes, according to the previous contract, the outcome payer is going to pay for those outcomes. Then the service provider will get some parts of the payment and the investor gets some return to the investment. And this is how social impact bonds work. Again, in theory, this sounds great, but there are many things that we don't know about how this works in reality and what are the challenges of implementing such projects. So for example, 
um, what are the challenges and opportunities that practitioners face with these projects? What are the difficulties that public servants and, and procurement officers face in adapting to these projects? How much they cost? I, I, are they really less expensive than other type of projects? These are all things and all questions that we don't know the answer. But this is why we started with our impact bond data set. Our impact bond data set collects data about these type of projects all across the world. That's why you can see a map where all impact bonds that we know of are represented in a particular place of the globe. We are interested in many, many different things. We want to know about date, about timing, how much time do you need to develop one of these projects? We want to know about the financial aspect, how much funds do you need to start one of them? We will also want to know about the actors involved in this ecosystem of outcome-based projects. We want to know about the legal arrangements. We want to know who holds the contract with the outcome payer. Is it the service provider? Is it the outcome fund? Is it the social investor? Is it an intermediary organization, maybe? And we are especially interested in knowing about the outcome metrics. We want to know how are you contracting for outcomes? How do you define outcomes? How do you price them? And especially this, how do you measure them? I will not say many more things about uh, our impact on data set because I'm running out of time, but I strongly encourage you to get into our GoLab website. Under the Indigo initiative, you will find this data set and you can play with the map, you can play around with the filters and you can filter if you're especially interested in the UK, you can filter by country. And if you are especially interested in health projects, you can help, you can filter by the policy sector and just select the health projects. Why we do this? We do this because we believe that getting data will facilitate learning across projects. As you may understand, this is something uh, this is something that is still experimental and it's going to be faster if we learn all together instead of learning in silos. This data fits directly into the goal of evaluation of the Life Chances Fund project, which is the latest fund of impact bond projects that the UK government is supporting. So we also use this data to evaluate the project, but this data is complemented with other qualitative interviews. Of course, there is a matter of transparency here as well, and the CMS is really interested in sharing this data because at the end of the day, these projects are paid with public money. So the public deserves to know where the money has been invested. And finally, we are really interested in making international comparisons and understanding how the UK projects differ to the French projects or the US projects or some old projects from other parts of the world. And this is the last thing I'm going to do. I'm going to say something about the challenges of working as a data collaborative. There are challenges and opportunities. And apart from the opportunities that are already named in the literature and other places, I would say that the good thing about working as a data collaborative is that the peer pressure starts playing in our favor. So the organizations start feeling that they need to share data. And there is some community involvement that at least for me is invaluable. When people share data about their projects, they really start owning the asset and they are more prone to sharing data, but also they are more prone to le share learnings with, with us and they are more prone to getting involved in our engagement activities. Of course, there are some disadvantages, and I would say that some organizations are more willing to share data than other ones, and that's why our data may be patchy and it's imperfect, but we are working on this, and we need to address this by having different strategies for different type of organizations. I'm going to stop there because I know I'm running out of time, but I, I'm really, really thankful for Gavin for inviting me here today, for letting me share my experience, and if you need to connect with me, here's my email. I will be happy to answer questions later. Fantastic, Juliana. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and quite a different spin, I think, on, on the sort of theme that we've been exploring today. Just a reminder to everybody watching, if you would like me to put your question to Juliana, then uh, go to the Slido, which if you're not already on it, is bit.ly slash Slido DB26, capital S, capital DB. Um, you mentioned uh, during your presentation about that, that sort of building cross-sector partnerships. Um, how do you go about doing that, um, specifically around sort of data? Well, that's a really, really good question. I will um, refer to something that the previous speakers already mentioned, which is trust. I think that the key for building a data collaborative, which uh, relies on different organizations sharing data, is building a trustful relationship. 
because they really need to trust us to host their data and to share it with the wider community. So trust is key. And how you build trust, you build trust being open and making sure that your data set and your data infrastructure has all the requirements and all the data privacy protections and all the protocol, the quality protocols in place um, are the right protocols for the right data. So I think it's all about building a trustful relationship with the ecosystem, which we are on our way and I think we are doing that. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Sam from Med Confidential. Is there an area which you think is underexplored with the potential for large benefits? I would say I've seen many impact bonds, not so much about environmental. I, I haven't seen many environmental impact bonds. I would say that's something that is underexplored. But I think that there are more of those coming up. I've seen many of them uh, or some of them happening in Canada and some organizations are starting to try this new idea of having an impact bond or some kind of result-based financing instrument that tries to deal with the problem of climate change. So I think that's the new thing coming up. And I think that's the new thing where this ecosystem is going to start paying attention to. But I think that's the main thing. Climate change is what is coming next. Excellent, thanks. I think that's, that's been a theme that's uh, starting to come through in various data bytes presentations as well. Um, we've got a question from Jonathan Flowers. Um, he says, it's a little frustrating that because social impact bonds involve private investment, they demand very much higher standards of proof of effectiveness than many other policy initiatives. Shouldn't governments simply take a bit more of a chance on investing in early intervention? I'm not so sure if uh, I can answer this question, but what I'm going to say is that social impact bonds are just one type of outcome-based contract and result-based financing. So this, uh, the, the idea of having uh, the involvement of an investor is something that many people discuss. We really don't know the answer yet if that's the best option or not. But what I can say is that the key thing here is not so much the idea of the social impact bond, but the idea of the outcome focus. There are many ways uh, to structure a project with an outcome focus. It can involve or not an investor, but I think the key thing here that we could learn is how having a look or being focused on the outcome changes the whole equation of public services. If there is an investor involved or not, if it is better or not to have an investor, I, I, I really don't know. And that's why we are collecting data at the CoLab, because we really want to understand that question. I wouldn't be in a position to say it's better or it's not better. But that's something that we need more data to to be able to respond with the necessary evidence. Great, thank you. Um, Paul Marshall, uh, and sorry for not getting to your question on previous speaker, Paul, uh, says, great to see the use of a logic model and trying to get people to focus on outcomes. The really hard thing with commissioning for outcomes is that by definition, outcomes are subject to externalities. You can't, uh, you can't attribute an outcome exclusively to the commissioned inputs. Are you overcoming this in your work? I think that's a great question. It's a question that the whole literature about outcome-based financing is trying to understand. And there's something else that I want to say and I want to acknowledge, which is, of course, we all want to measure outcomes and we all want to focus on outcomes, but outcomes are really, really hard to measure. And sometimes it is preferable to focus on an output because you can measure, you can be sure if a service provider produces an outcome, an output. But it's really difficult to measure an outcome. Uh, it's even more difficult to measure impact. This is a really, really big word. I don't know if, um, at least me, from the data point of view of this, I really wouldn't say that we have an answer. I know that the GoLab research team, which is evaluating the latest round of impact bonds in the UK, the one supported by the Life Chances Fund, is trying to understand this question. But from the data point of view, I don't have an answer yet. And I think it's going to be a while until I have an answer because we need to wait for these programs to develop at least for a while to see how much we can compare outputs and outcomes. And I, just one more thing that I want to add is we speak a lot about outcomes, but it all depends on how you define them. And sometimes we define outcomes in such a broad way that it's really, really hard to measure them. So again, a lot goes into the definition of these outcomes and a lot goes into the description of these outcomes in the contracts that these 
different organizations are signing. Thank you. Do you find that there are there are very different approaches in different countries to how they think about these sorts of questions and the sort the sorts of um, things that you've just been talking about? I don't know if there are different approaches, but what I would say is that there are very different interests. So, for example, countries in Latin America that have been experimenting with this uh, tool, they are really focused on employment services. So. Not all, but most of the projects in Latin America are focused on giving people the right skills to get formal jobs. Whereas if you go to Africa, uh, lots of the projects that you see there are more related uh, with health projects or education projects. In the UK, there are lots of health projects. And when I say health, I mean mental health or family, child and family well-being. Like those type of projects are very, very common here in the UK. And if you go to Europe, you see lots of projects uh, about education, you see lots of projects about employment, etc. So I, I don't know if there is a different approach. What I see is a real interest in the tool, but they are using it for very different things, depending on the interest of the region and the needs of the region, of course. Excellent, thank you. We've got under 90 seconds left. If anyone's got any final questions, do put them in very quickly. And um, what does what does success look like for, for GoLab? When will you know that you've achieved what you wanted to? Success for the GoLab, I will speak uh, with two different lines. Success for the GoLab, uh, the GoLab is a research center. So success for the GoLab is to produce the highest quality research about this type of tool. It's not to promote one or the other one, but to produce to produce great evidence about which ones work and which ones don't, and to produce the highest quality data set, not just about impact bonds, but about outcome-based projects, so you can compare them, and public, serv and public servants have a tool to say, this is the way we need to go, this is the project, this is the, the, this is the arrangement that we can use, or this is the arrangement that will not, will not be good for us. Success for this type of tools means improving public services and finding a way of having better public services so we can generate better social outcomes. But this is something for the tool in itself. The Go Lab is a research center that will produce research and our success is to produce the highest quality possible research. Excellent, well, that nearly brings us perfectly to time. So Juliana, thank you very great. much indeed for joining us. It's been great to hear from you. Thank you. And all that remains uh, for me to say uh, are a few uh, parish notices before I leave you. Um, first of all, um, we will be having uh, virtual drinks. If the information is not already on the screen, then the link is bit.ly slash DB26 drinks and the password is IFG DB26. Do join us for a bit if you can. Uh, there are lots of other Institute for Government events coming up um, over the next uh, couple, next week or so um, on everything from a new project with the Bennett Institute on reforming the UK constitution uh, to what to do with the Department for Education, the director of the Institute for Government's annual lecture and a small matter of former Prime Minister Sir John Major speaking next next week. Uh, the next data bites will of course be on Wednesday the 2nd of March at 6pm so please do put that in your diary along with 6pm on the first Wednesday of the month all the way through to July. All that remains now for me to say are three very, very big thank yous. First of all, to Bearing Point for supporting us this evening. As I said, we can only continue this series thanks to our sponsors. So a huge thank you to them. A huge thank you to all of you for tuning in tonight and some fantastic questions. And of course, last but certainly not least, please do join me in a virtual round of applause for our fantastic speakers this evening. A big thank you to them. And we look forward to seeing you either at drinks or at the next Data Bytes next month. Thank you very much indeed. Good night.